cup of coffee, sit back and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life features stories to inspire and motivate you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Visit CYACYL.com. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. If you survived a devastating car accident in which your father and sister were killed and you were left paralyzed from the chest down, what do you think your outlook on life would be like? Today's guest, Matthew Sanford, was 13 when his world was turned upside down. He survived such an accident, he was left paralyzed from the chest down. Matthew's story is one with unfathomable pain that would have easily broken any one of us, and yet he persevered. Matthew had a choice point in his life, and from that tragedy, he chose to tap into his inner strength and create an abundant life. Today, Matthew is a public speaker, healthcare pioneer, award-winning author, and nationally recognized yoga teacher who has inspired and enhanced the lives of thousands. He's the author of the book, Waking, a Memoir of Trauma and Transcendence. Matthew shares his philosophy on the importance of the mind-body relationship and our inner capacity for strength, growth, and transformation. He founded Mind Body Solutions, a nonprofit dedicated to transforming trauma, loss, and disability into hope and potential. Mind Body Solutions is redefining ability and disability by offering a variety of resources, workshops, and classes. Matthew's been featured throughout media, including The Today Show, Dr. Oz, Oprah and Friends, and People Magazine, among others. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks for joining us today. It's an honor. Thank you. Matthew, as I was reading your book, I tried to imagine what you were going through during the time after that accident, and I just wasn't able to comprehend any of it. I, I just have so much. I can't even tell you how much I appreciate what you've been able to go on and do and what an inspiration you are to so many people. So I'm really happy that you're here, and, and thank you for, for joining us and for sharing this amazing story with us. Yeah, and part of, part of my story is that that we all have capacity for strength and choice that we're not always believing we have. And it takes getting measured to know that you have it. But I think that more people could do well with, with hardship than they know. And that's usually a defining moment in our lives when we get to that point where, you know, we, I had a guest, Harry Massey, who came on, and we called it a choice point where you get to that fork in the road and you can either go one direction, which really isn't going to serve you well, or you can muster up your strength and, and find whatever way you can to survive and get through it and take a different path that is often your true calling in life. And, and one of the things that's, you know, being injured at 13, and I was, I was incredibly injured. I, was, I, mean, I broke my neck and my back and both my wrists and filled the lung with fluid and sustained an injury to my pancreas that left me unable to eat for 60 days. So I went from a 119-pound, very athletic boy to 79 pounds in less than 60 days. And, and I'd like to say that, you know, I was so, I was, it was life and death for, a, you know, I was in a coma for three and a half days, all these things. And as, as a 13, one of the stories, one of the things in Waking that's so powerful in the book is that I wasn't able, I was so injured and so young, I didn't consciously choose. I didn't have an exact choice point as an adult would have. But the brilliance of survival, the drive to go towards living and towards my remaining family, because um, my, 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 my brother and my mother survived the accident. We were all in the car together. That, that it was a move of survival and beauty and love that drew me forward, as opposed to me saying, I'm choosing to live. I remember opening my eyes from the coma and seeing my brother's you know, tears and my mom's bruised face and feeling, oh my goodness, I need to live for them. And that wasn't true it was what I, my survival, my innocence, thought, okay, I'll live for them, because I wasn't ready to take in how injured I was. I, but I was able to connect to who I loved. And that there's a, that's where the strength comes from, too. It's not just a choice. Sometimes it is a choice. But for me, it was a 13-year-old boy and his innocence and his love for his family that got me through that initial week or two. You mentioned your mother and brother survived the accident, and that was the other thing. I was trying to think, 
going through the, the type of injuries that you sustained at that point would have been enough, but you were going through the grief of losing your father and sister. And you're, you know, I'm thinking about your poor mother and brother. They lost a, a sister and daughter and father and husband while they're dealing with what you're going through. And it, it was so heartwarming, as you just spoke about, when you opened your eyes and you came out of it, you, you were saying to yourself that you need to do this for them. And, you know, I think that that call it the grace of God, whatever you want to refer to it as, but that was where you drew your strength from so you could move on. And I think that one of the, my favorite lines in the book is I say that, you know, trauma doesn't happen to an individual or even to one family. It happens to a community. And I think that there is the individual strength that we like to romanticize in our culture, which is also true, right, in, especially in the United States. But there is a strength that comes from going in a community and having a family and and opening your eyes and seeing beyond yourself. In a way, all my work with with my body solutions and helping people with all sorts of trauma loss and disability is a continuation of that initial choice. To decide to have what happened to me have meaning and 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 depth in a wider community. And that's why I pioneered yoga. I mean, you know, I started yoga 13 years after my accident. I just saw the opportunity, but not just as a 13-year-old boy. It developed over time. I realized that I wanted to go forward, and my youthfulness, I didn't ever, I was so close to dying, but I never really entertained that thought. I was too young. My innocence just figured I'd live. And I remember the doctors telling my mom in that period, they said, it's so, it's so great that Matt doesn't know how injured he is, just going forward. For a moment on the medical side, another lesson of your story really is to take charge of your own medical care because your initial care was probably going to kill you. And it wasn't until your mom got some advice and really became an advocate for you that you got the type of care right. you needed that was able to save your life and bring you where you are today. I think that that's a good, a really important point and a fine balance. You've got to let the experts be the experts, but my mom intuitively knew and, and actually some of the nurses came up to my mom while I was first waking up out of the coma saying, you better get him out of here. His injury, injuries are so extensive. And, you know, there are defining moments. We talk about choice points. I try to imagine being my mother in that, in that moment where she's lost her husband and her firstborn and her baby's hanging in the balance. And she gets told that, that she said, I want to get him out of here. And the doctors tell her, um, well, we don't think he'll survive his trip decided the trip to the Mayo Clinic, and in fact, that sometimes people are so injured, Paula, you should just, that's my mom's name, Paula, you should just let people go, let your loved ones go. And at that moment, Mama Tiger, poof, one of the strongest presence on the planet, forces on the planet is Mama Tiger. And she then just, without much ceremony, just got me out of there and led to the rest of my life. Now, Matthew, we spoke about in the beginning how you kicked almost into that survival mode for your mother and brother, but then as you went through the procedures, which, as I said, unfathomable pain, screws being twisted into your skull, and, and just things, as I said, I can't even imagine, you learned to almost detach from your body in order to survive. At 13 years old, you were years ahead of, of what adults are still trying to figure out. So what lessons did you learn during that time that were able to sustain you? Well, you know, I think that human consciousness is an amazing force, right? And we did, you know, the brain can detach from the senses. And that's a survival skill in, in the short term. I mean, so we know that kids that are, sex, that are sexually abused tend to black it out, sexual assault victims, you know, kids that have trauma in, in, their, in their youth, and that that is something that the brain can do. It's a short-term strategy, and the story of waking in my story is learning that, that I was able to merge with the lights. When things were happening to me, I was able to kind of just, just associate from my body to get through the physical pain. But the story of waking is the story of if you get too comfortable being disconnected from your body, because once that habit starts, it's easy to maintain. And, this, and it isn't just an extreme trauma. There are people that are very heady and very intellectual that have, are almost not present or barely present in their body. I mean, and, and we leave our bodies all the time. Think about that time you were driving down the interstate 
and you're driving 70 miles an hour or 65 or whatever, and all of a sudden you startle with the realization that you haven't even noticed the landscape for 20 minutes. This happens all the time. This is like part of the feature of being a human being. And, but it's recognizing when you, when you can disassociate for good reason, but then always coming back, always moving back into the world, because it's not a sustainable strategy to live disconnected from your body. Not only does your health go bad, but you're not mentally as present. You're not able to be as loving. I mean, the body is the best home your mind will ever have. And that is true even in my body, that, you know, 34 years later, I was injured in 1978, um, um, that, that even in my body, which has a lot of chronic pain from breaking so many bones and stuff, it is still the best home my mind will ever have. It's the only body I'll ever get. I love that. The body's the best home the mind will ever have. And I think on that note, Matthew, we're going to take a break for this week's Good Life Tips. Stay with us for information to help you make the positive life changes that we talk about on the show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman, and our guest today is Matthew Sanford, author of the book, Waking, A Memoir of Trauma and Transcendence. Matthew, you are paralyzed from the chest down. Why yoga? Why and how did you become interested in yoga? Um, You know, there are layers to that answer. Um, One is that I got lucky. I met a fabulous yoga teacher right out of the gate. If I hadn't met a a fantastically compassionate and open-hearted teacher as the first one I met, um, that it probably wouldn't have sustained. But then, so that's one layer to the story. But it also, I needed to find a different way. Basically, the rehabilitation model that I encountered as a 13-year-old boy told me that sensation below my chest, below my point of injury, where, I'm, where, my, where my back, where my spinal cord severed, um, was impossible, and that I should learn to make my arms really strong and learn to drag my paralyzed body through life, basically. And that's basically the vision of compensation that dominates um, neurologic de- deficit. We, you know, we want me to overcome my disability and achieve things. And what that led to is me kind of becoming a floating upper torso over the next 12 years. That I, I just pay attention mostly to my upper body, maintain my, my the bottom two-thirds of my body, but ended up getting really unhappy. I mean, I was, a very, I was a fun-loving, very athletic kid that loved his body. I loved jumping and hanging upside down and and all those things. And so, and then at the same time, I started having rotator cuff problems because after 20 years or 30, as 12 years, I was already having problems with my rotator cuff, mm-hmm. pushing a wheelchair around. And so all these things came together and, and, and I, and I, someone suggested yoga and I found the right teacher. On another level below that, there's, I, from that, from being able to leave my body in intensive care and, and, and getting through what I got through, I always knew and felt in my bones that there was more, that consciousness had more features to it. There's a connection to the body. And I talk about it as silence in, in, in waking, that we all have an inward silence in our mind-body relationship that is the true, true place of strength. It's where strength resides. It's also where stress lies, or lands. It's also where anxiety lands. But that part of the mind-body relationship somehow got cracked open to me when I was going through the, the violence that saved my life in the hospital. Right? And that nagging feeling made me know that there was a different way and that, I wanted, that there was, it was worth pursuing. And it was a very vague feeling and that, I, that I decided that I could do something like yoga that clearly I can't do standing poses, but now as I teach around the country, you know, I teach people, walking people all the time, I teach them all sorts of things because the mind-body relationship has more in it than we know and that I can teach all those things and feel them too, which is even crazier. Um, so, you know, why I started yoga, why I did yoga, survival again. I wanted to find a better life. I wanted to feel better. People ask me, well, why should I do yoga? It's like, because it feels better. It's pretty simple. The more you live in your body and live in your body well, the better your life will improve and the stronger you're going to feel. And now you're helping other people do that. I mean, you have a program, Beyond Disability, a yoga practice with Matthew Sanford. What is your goal of that program? And who is it for? Who is it directed for? It, that's actually a DVD. Mm-hmm. And what it is is a, a seated yoga practice 
that's actually intended as for people that don't that that it's t- intended as a bridge between inactivity and activity. So it's not just for people with disability. It might be someone that's really lost track of their body or has diabetes or is is overweight or is elderly, you know, and and thinking that they can't live dynamically in their body. And it's a series of of it, it you meet our adaptive yoga students, but it focuses on four sensations. The the sensation of being grounded. Right now there's a sensation that every one of your listeners needs to study more. What is it like to feel grounded in your body? The sensation of balance. Like what is that sensation in your body, not just in your life, because that's harder to achieve, but what does it feel like in your body so you can then generalize to your life? The sensation of expansion. Like and this is especially for older people, it's like moving from your sits bones out to the top of your head, out through your shoulders. The inward movement of expanding in your body is analogous to what it means to expand in your life. Right? So the sensation of expansion, because life makes everyone feel smaller. It's big, it's complicated, we tend to drop our shoulders, drop our chest, we tend to slouch, because life's big and heavy and, and we have like pain in our, you know, in our shoulders. It's like, no, the sensation of expansion is a really important sensation. And then also the sensation of rhythm, being playful with your body, moving your body in ways that has more grace in it. When you have those four sensations, grounding, balance, expansion, and rhythm, you've got a good yoga pose. And so what, by focusing on the sensations that make a good yoga pose, it gets across that you don't have to be able to take your leg behind your head to do yoga, right? You have to feel some basic nourishing sensations and practice them in your body. And that's what, that's what that DVD is about. Matthew, talk to parents who are in the position that your mother was in and have a child that was injured and they're dealing with some type of physical challenge. What can these parents do to best assist their child? Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, I have a 12-year-old son now. Um, anything that a, the only thing a parent can ever truly do is love your child through their destiny, which is not an easy thing to do. However, um, staying steadfast, staying supportive, you know, you, they can't fix everything. See, a parent, and, and I know this from being one, you want to make everything better and fix everything. Well, there are things that you don't get to fix, but you can stay steadfast with. My mom was extraordinary in believing in me, in believing that, that I could do wonderful things, that there was something special about me, that I was going to be able to find a way to express that even if it wasn't as directly through my body. And paradoxically, it, it ended up coming through my body because of the type of yoga teacher I am. But, but like, that there's that. There, I mean, that's on a, on a very... Um, deep level, and then and then you know providing opportunities for your child, and and trying to help your child feel comfortable in the bottom they in the body they have, because a lot of it we want people even now, and even the rehabilitation model wants me to. A lot of the message I get is, how can I be as if I weren't disabled, right, or or accomplish everything, or overcome my disability, and in fact, it's really important for a whole bunch of reasons, including self-esteem and. And, and belief in oneself, to be comfortable in the body they have. But this is a truth that isn't just true for someone with, a, with living with a disability. And every one of your listeners, being, being more grounded and accepting the body you have and then realizing that's your best vehicle of success. And it's so, you know, it's easy for me to believe I was supposed to overcome my body. But in fact, my true strength comes from living in my whole body. So that kind of self-image, that kind of belief in that the body, it's not my body's fault that I can't control my bladder. It's that I severed my spinal cord, right? And, and so I have to do things to make up for that, and sometimes and, and I have to do things like catheterize and all sorts of things that are the, the, the thing that are part of a spinal cord injury, but accepting that that's not my body's fault. And trying to pass that on to a child that's living with difficult things means that the parent has to believe it for themselves, too. If you'd like more information about Matthew, his DVD, his book, or his work, you can visit his websites, matthewsanford.com or mindbodysolutions.org. Again, that's matthewsanford.com 
or mindbodysolutions.org, or as always, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows as podcasts, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, take part in the book club, and be sure to follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Matthew, thank you so much for spending time with us today. As I said, your story to me is such an inspiration, and you just have reminded us that anything, anything in this life is possible. So thank you for being here with us. And thank you for the work you're doing. This is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.